Okay, barrel is installed in the lathe. Uh, I've got a half thousandths or point zero 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 five dial test indicator on a range rod with a bushing with a removable pilot, well, bushing in this case. And so we're centered on the um, outboard end and within a few tenths here. We are spinning true. Um, what I'm gonna do first, like I said, is part this off. Uh, get that off and then recenter everything. Okay, part it off. The stub of the breech end it came off nicely. Parting tool with a slight 45 angle leading in. Uh, took a little time, but it came off. I'll well, set that aside. Now we're just going to check, make sure we didn't slip out of alignment. All right, back here at the vise, bench vise. Um, anytime I do a barrel, no matter what, no matter if it's one of these old ones. A Remington, a uh, modern one like a Defiance, or uh, what's that one that you can get pre head spaced? And pretty much all these actions nowadays are machined in such a way that uh, basically you can go off the dimensions they provide. And if, as long as everything's within tolerance, and their tolerances are pretty tight, but as long as they're there, head space should line up. They could be interchangeable and all that good stuff. Regardless of all that, I still take measurements. I, I don't care. I don't trust anything or <laughs> anyone. So I will take physical measurements from the, from the action itself. So in order to get two hands free, I'll just lightly clamp it in a vise. That way I can get my depth micrometer in there and measure. And then I got a spec sheet that I always like to fill out. Uh, just keeps everything straight, obviously, tidy. and um you know a, a record of, of what what's been done to it in the actual dimensions of uh of the features of the receiver um from that facing operation there was a tiny burr that kind of got pulled up so i'm just going to stone the the edge here the internal edge there's a couple little frays that came up we don't want to be measuring off a burr we'll get that Cleaned up. <clears throat> okay. That feels good. Get the schmutz off of the bolt face. <clears throat> okay. So what we're measuring for here is clearances, lengths, diameters, well, we know diameters, but basically length and clearances. Um, we don't want a bunch of slop in the headspace dimension, a bunch of slop in, in the, the barrel, things like that. Um, but there really is only one measurement for this. This is a cone breech system. So that just means the, the bolt nose itself has, you know, like 45 degree kind of taper to it. Um, so really all I'm going to take is a measurement from the, from the front, from the face of the receiver to the face of the bolt. So that'll give us our head space, uh, at least for the cartridge and the go gauge. So just feeling around that is perfectly flat. Uh, there's no play there. It feels like glass. So that's good. Come down, take a reading. Six, six, you're kidding me, 666? Well, isn't that awesome? This is the action of Satan. 666, I'll be dipped. <clears throat> okay, find a pencil and record that number. 
Okay, so very good. Um, with Springfield, there is a given dimension for the length. We've shaved off four and a half thousandths off the face. <clears throat> Since we shaved off four thousandths and a half off the face, we're going to go with 730 uh, just to account for that um, shortening of the, of the face of that receiver. It's a cone breach, as I mentioned, so really there's plenty of clearance because you're gonna be, we're going to be cutting a cone breach, essentially. So this section of the bolt will be encapsulated in that cone breach, and there'll be a giant uh, extractor cut on the right side. Well, depending on how you look at it, if you're looking through the breach, it's going to be on the right side for uh, that extractor to, to be able to go in, pivot, grab the case, pull out. We'll, uh, we'll come back after it's threaded and fit on, and then show you the cone breach. That, that may be interesting to some people. So uh, stick around, go grab a coffee, be right back. Uh, we should have a threaded tenon, and we'll see you then. Okay, back here at the lathe. Uh, I've got the threads cut, the length established, uh, a few relief cuts in there. Uh, but anyway, the uh, <clears throat> receiver screws right on. Right. My compound slide or compound rest, however, however you want to call it, is set at 42 degrees. 42 degrees matches the bolt and is what's recommended on these and then for the cutting I've got what's called a radius cutter Which has literally a radius <clears throat> right there at the end You can use single point cutter for this too, but it gives a nice finish <clears throat> So we'll install that here Sorry, I couldn't get much footage of that. Um, again, I, I want to figure out a way to mount this to the lathe itself so we can get a view kind of, so I'm not walking around the camera and stumbling over crap and whatnot. But anyway, cone breach, right? Very common with these older, even in the uh, end fields. Uh, they all have cone breaches, except the Mauser. Mauser was smart. <laughs> all right, action, there it is. Face is clean. So that should allow the bolt to close. movement just means it's got clearance cool this barrel is ready for chambering that it was hitting there, so we're good. Clearances are good. Length, diameter, threads, comb breach. All cut, so like I said, now we're ready to do the chamber. Before we cut this chamber, I always like to make sure the barrel's still spinning true. 
Uh, so back here at the spider, literally a four jaw chuck in the back of the spindle bore with a precisely fit 30 cal range rod with a 0.2998 bushing. Zero run out. And here at the chuck. Oh, that moved a little bit. Let's fix that. High. It's a bit high. It's a bit high. Um, I have these bushings here, <clears throat> and they're all incrementally sized. So these are this is a 30 caliber set. So we got oops, let's put this the right way. Three. Oh, that was the right way. <laughs> so three oh oh two. Um, goes all the way up to three. Oh, oh, eight. That would be an inc excessively large bore, so hopefully we never use that one. And all the way down to 2992, I believe. And that would be an excessively tight bore. This particular barrel, 2998. So I like that. That means that bore is just a tad tight. Snug, we'll call it. Certainly not uh, loose. <clears throat> So that's good. That's what I had on the range rod. The 300, no, sorry, 2998. And this is the bushing we will use for the reamer. So I like to figure that out before I start pre drilling or boring the chamber or anything like that. That way I can feel it and just know for sure that that bore is that size, right? So barrel is recentered. We can go. Uh, Basically, I'm going to pre-drill about 40 thousandths, 50 thousandths small, uh, and short, of, obviously short of the cartridge length. Come in with a reamer. So I got my reamer pre-installed in my GTR uh, GTR tooling reamer holder. Um, not a floating reamer holder in terms of back here. This is rigidly held on a center. So when I set up my tail stock, I used this in the spindle bore um, to uh, center the, I'm gonna try to say tail stock. So this is perfectly centered within two tenths again. I mean, Jesus, you're, you're, we're splitting hairs at that point, but two tenths side to side, two tenths up and down then this portion of the reamer can can move with the bore if the bore does wander slightly and each every barrel the bore is never actually perfectly straight you got a bit of a curvature in there you know so as long as your tail stocks lined up right this is the tool to use for sure it's what i prefer um, rather than the floating reamer holders you see that float on the back side. They can tend to lend to an oversized chamber. I used it a lot in the old shop, uh, the floating reamer style. So I got no problems with them, but if I can go ahead and go with this tool, I'm going to do that. Um, so I purchased this from Greg Tannel and um, used it before in other shops and things. So, And so to figure out the drill we need, we're just going to measure the reamer carefully just right here at the shoulder transition and I just kind of close them up and then rotate to see the highest point 454 455 so something like 410 somewhere in there will be the drill that I'm going to use uh, and then we'll true the true the chamber the pre-drill chamber with the boring bar so I'm going to go select a drill that's somewhere in this 400 range and uh, pre-drill the chamber to go ahead and figure this out too. So here's a go gauge. 
So we'll drill. You know, we could go. That would be full depth. So I don't know. I don't know. An inch and a half just to be on the safe side. That'll give us plenty of meat to correct for any potential chatter or any other uh, problems we may encounter on the on the chambering uh, side of things. So right, I'm gonna go fish out a drill and uh, drill this uh, pre-drill the chamber. Got the boring boring. Just gonna skim this. True up the hole after drilling. Ready for the reamer. I fed the reamer in about a hundred thousandths ish and I just got my dial test indicator in to measure to see if we have any chatter, deflection, or run out. <clears throat> and we're still sitting where we were. Um, I'm sorry you can't see this but I've, I've got the indicator probe <laughs> The indicator probe on the section of the chamber that I just cut with the uh, chambering reamer. <clears throat> and we're still within a tenth or maybe, maybe two. So everything's looking good here. Uh, we'll just proceed to chamber this. So I'll give it another quarter inch or so and check again. But so far we're looking good. I like to feel the reamer as it makes a cut. Again, just to ensure there's no chatter. There it's engaged. Feeling nice and smooth. Sounds good. Okay. Nice chips on that reamer. <laughs> See that? 
Yeah. Nice curly chips on every flute. So that's what you want to see. I don't see any visual chatter. So we'll come back when we're a little bit deeper. Okay, we're almost to full depth on the reamer, so a go gauge. So this is going to be sub flush by 64 thousandths. And I just checked the action and it's still not closing, which is a good sign. Let's get a measurement. 43 thousandths, so something like 20, 21. Down. So, tiny little gap there. Check it. So this ruler's twenty thousand, so it's not going in. So we're under twenty. So let's go fifteen thousand. Snap, I might be there right there. Okay. We're probably about a thousandths off. Because I could feel like I could. Yep. I think we're there. So, should be a hard stop on this. All right, I think we're there. All right, well, let's torque it on real good. Yeah, that's as far as I can go there. Okay. Okay, I might give it one more thousand. <clears throat> or we've got some chips in there. So let me clean out the bowl real good. Make sure there's no Obstructions, you know, there could be a little tiny chip there in the bolt face, maybe inside the chamber. Double check the lugs, make sure there's nothing schmutz on the lugs or nothing. When you're this close. So since the 30-06 cartridge head space is on a shoulder, I just wanted to make sure everything was clean in there. There's no play there. No schmutz on the... So the head space is somewhere in the middle of the shoulder area. Yeah. 
Now I could, I could. Eh. <laughs> it's all about feel here. See, it closes there, but not all the way. Let's crack it loose. Yeah, it's got to come all the way there. And it's not quite. I could force it close, but don't do that. All right, so let's attempt to take one more thousand out of the chamber. That is the go gauge. Yes. <clears throat> okay. One more thousand. There we go. So now, when that's torqued on, good and tight, um, there should be, well, there's no play here whatsoever, but that will snug it up to zero minimal headspace. All right, so before I get too excited, let's check it with the no-go. Still a hard stop. So that that guy's in headspace. Yeah, very happy with this so far. The proof will be in the pudding when we shoot it and start playing around with grouping and things, but uh, this chamber is well within minimal headspace. Which just means the shooter, especially in a case of reloading, the cases won't stretch as much and whatnot. So normally uh, with this I will um, take the go gauge and put a piece of cellophane tape on the back of it, which uh, the thickness of that is usually two thousandths. So that gives me a little bit tighter headspace measurement or, or means of checking. Um, in this case though, the my customer is um, not a hand loader and he's going to be trying out a whole bunch of different ammo different brands and bullet weights so i want to give him the flexibility of being able to chamber anything without struggling to to, to you know close the bolt on a case that might be just a slight bit big or uh conversely you know firing it and it's so tight that he has to bash the bolt open to get open in a hunting situation that's not good you you want total functionality and no hang-ups and, and anything like that so he we we talked about it and we both felt like it'd be the best to chamber this to sammy spec with a traditional go and no go gauge so we got about four thousandths difference um generally speaking could be three could be five hopefully it's not five but in any event uh this this is uh what we were shooting for here so that's nothing in it Still closes. See, the bolt's got play with nothing in the chamber, right? So, again, I don't have any live rounds or uh, dummy cartridges to check, but just to show you the go gauge, see, there's nothing there. Now, there's a little play there just because the bolt's small, smaller than the raceway, and we talked about that earlier. So, engaged with the go gauge, the bolt has zero wiggle this way, meaning perfect headspace, perfect dimension. All right, so um, I guess just to show you that one more time. So, no trickery here. Go gauge is in, in the chamber. Pull out the go gauge, and there's your clearance with it empty, right? So again, we're we're right on the money. So now all that's left to do is cut an extractor groove 
for the extractor, um, get all that stuff lined up, and torque on the barrel. So the machining, the actual lathe work, is completed. Um, I will go in and polish the chamber and the cone a little bit, make it look nice, and just give that chamber a, a smooth finish. So there's no uh, risk of cases getting stuck or, or whatever like that. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll set some things aside and get ready for uh, polishing and do that up real quick. So all we're doing here is uh, polishing out the, the little machining marks that the reamer leaves behind. And it's a very small amount. It's a nice sharp reamer, so the finish was already pretty good. But again, this just eliminates any chance of the case snagging on anything or getting stuck due to a, a little uh, ring or burr inside there. And I'm stopping at the shoulder. I'm not going like over the ramp into the bore. So I don't want to mess with the uh, throat area. Or the transition of the right wing. Come down, do the cone a little bit. And then of course it makes all the visible surfaces really nice and shiny. So if the guy's cleaning his gun, he glances in there and sees his nice shiny barrel. At least after he cleans it. He might he might appreciate that. Maybe not, I whatever. So almost a mirror finish on that cone, and trust me, the inside is, is not quite as polished as this, but certainly is smooth and uh, ready for test mine. Okay, so we're done here on the breach. Uh, probably cut and crown it next, and then uh, get her in the milling machine to do the extractor.